So welcome to the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm Jeff Mogridge and I'm a professor uh, in the department. Um, the first thing to say is that the course we run is Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology, so you study both elements of the subject uh, in one course. So a little bit about what uh, we're going to do in this talk today. Um, so the first thing I'll do is tell you a little bit generally about what chemical engineering and biotechnology is, uh, what chemical engineers and biotechnologists do, and why you might want to study it. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit more specifically uh, about the Cambridge course and how you could apply to it. So first of all, what do chemical engineers and biotechnologists do? Uh, and the answer is actually all sorts of different things. And so this slide gives you just a little snapshot of some of the many and varied uh, different things that chemical engineers and biotechnologists get up to in their professional lives. Um, so just to give you a couple of very simple examples, um, one of my first students designed the small Pringles tin in the first year after graduating uh, from this department. Uh, another ran a large sewage plant in Egypt uh, and a third started a chocolate plant uh, in Poland. So, um, Chemical engineering and biotechnology involves the design and operation of processes uh, to produce chemical or biochemical change and therefore products. And this is done on an industrial scale. And absolutely critically, it has to be done efficiently, safely, and increasingly with a great emphasis on cleanly and without uh, environmental uh, damage. So a key part of this is working at large scale. Um, that's what distinguishes in many ways a chemical engineer, for example, from a chemist. Um, now, many processes are either easy to do or at least perhaps well established uh, at the bench scale on the test tube scale uh, in the lab. But they may be far more complicated to do on an industrial scale uh, and that's where you need a chemical engineer or a biotechnologist to help you. So let me give you a very simple example. Uh, I think most of you would probably imagine you could make a cup of tea uh, fairly easily. But if I said to you, how are you going to make two million cups of tea per day, you'd probably think that was a much more challenging, and indeed it is, a much more challenging problem. And if I then said to you, well, you actually have to do that without wasting any ingredients, without wasting any energy, uh, and without leaving any pollution, that then becomes an even more challenging problem. So the sorts of things you would need to know in order, or need to understand in order to make two million cups of tea a day are, for example, how long does it take to brew the cup of tea? How does that depend on temperature and so on? Uh, those are problems in kinetics uh, and in mass transfer. You'd need to understand the mixing uh, of the tea and the water. You'd need to understand heat transfer, because obviously you're going to have to heat up uh, a very large amount of water. And of course, that involves a lot of thermodynamics. You're going to have to pump a lot of fluids around, and you're going to have to have big vessels uh, in which you make uh, the tea and then store it. Uh, you might need to separate things out. So for example, you might need to separate the tea leaves from the tea once you've made it. And of course, all of this you'd need to control uh, very efficiently and accurately in order to maintain uh, efficiency and safety. And then of course, you'd have to store and distribute those two million cups of tea uh, to the people in the places uh, where they want to use them. And these are exactly the sorts of um, subjects and problems uh, that chemical engineers and biotechnologists will study at university and then go on uh, to operate in an industrial context. So just to give you a little bit of an overview about chemical engineering and biotechnology, what do, what do people do in, in these subjects? Well, what they're going to do in an industrial uh, scenario would be to operate processes, to troubleshoot processes if they're not working too well, uh, to improve processes so that they work more efficiently, more cleanly, with less pollution and so on. And of course, sometimes it involves inventing new processes as well as operating existing processes. Now, what do you need to know in order to study a course which teaches you to do that sort of thing? Um, well, you'd need uh, a good background in pure science. So presumably many of you will be studying chemistry, physics, biology and so on uh, at, at A-level, but also some less familiar subjects. So uh, materials, for example, is very important uh, as an underlying pure science for chemical engineering and biotechnology. Um, it involves obviously uh, engineering and that means essentially the apply, uh, application 
uh, of those uh, pure sciences to real world problems. It's quite a mathematical subject. You don't have to be a brilliant mathematician, but you need to feel comfortable uh, doing mathematics. And of course, much of that mathematics now is done on computers. And so information technology is increasingly uh, becoming very important in the subject. Now, as well as those core bits of the subject, you also need a broader understanding of the commercial and social context in which you're working. And that means understanding a bit of economics, a lot about health, safety and the environment, and then maybe a bit about management, entrepreneurship, even things like languages. Many of the companies involved are international companies. A key part of chemical engineering and biotechnology is design, and that may involve uh, designing a process. That is a process to make a known product. So the cup of tea, for example, you know what the cup of tea is. The question is, how do you design the process to make that cup of tea? Uh, but it may also involve designing a new product. You might want to make a new version uh, of tea, for example. Uh, so both of those things are key uh, to the discipline. Uh, and, and then finally on this slide, um, why might you want to study this subject? I mean, I think most importantly, when you come to university, hopefully this will be something that is interesting and inspiring to you. Uh, but also it's a topic, a subject which is useful to society. Chemical engineers and biotechnologists do things that make a difference to the world, hopefully uh, in a positive way. You'll also acquire a very wide variety of skills and you can then go and apply those to things that aren't directly chemical engineering or biotechnology. And this leads to a great many career opportunities, both within the discipline, but also uh, in a wider sense beyond the discipline. Um, many of the companies involved are multinational companies, and so there's great opportunities to travel uh, in a career in chemical engineering or biotechnology, and it's a highly employable uh, subject. So many surveys suggest that chemical engineering, for example, is the most employable of the engineering uh, disciplines. And of course, a consequence of that is that it tends to be reasonably well rewarded financially. So let me just make a, a few generalizations to give you a bit more of an idea about what uh, uh, chemical engineering and biotechnology is. So um, if you think about science, you might think about scientists as people who make fundamental discoveries uh, and acquire new knowledge. And of course, many of those discoveries may go on to be useful in the real world. But generally speaking, that's not the focus of the scientist. It's the making of discoveries and the acquiring of new knowledge. Uh, by contrast, engineers apply that science uh, to design and build things uh, in the real world. So those might be engines, machines, structures, electrical equipment. In the case of chemical engineering uh, and biotechnology, that involves things where there's a chemical or a biochemical transformation uh, in the process by which those things are made. Uh, now, often uh, scientists are seen as more glamorous uh, than uh, engineers, but I think it's important to understand that, first of all, the world probably needs a lot more engineers than they do scientists. There's only a limited number of new discoveries uh, that can usefully be made uh, very quickly, uh, whereas there's an awful lot of engineering that needs doing. And secondly, engineers tend to have a big impact on the world now, whereas scientists may have a very big impact on the world, but it tends to be uh, on a longer time scale. So if you're interested in doing something now, uh, engineering is a good discipline for you. Engineering, chemical engineering and biotechnology actually is a subject which interfaces quite well between the two. So uh, there's quite a lot of fundamental science in chemical engineering and biotechnology, but there's also the opportunity to apply that uh, to the real world. So actually, if both of those things seem quite attractive to you, then this is quite a good uh, subject to think about. Uh, so here's a, a little uh, pie chart of uh, what people go on to do from this department. So this is roughly where they've gone in the last five years. Uh, and really the only purpose of showing this to you is to show you how varied the careers you can go on to. So you're not really restricting very strongly where you might go after a degree in chemical engineering and biotechnology by taking this degree. You can end up working in pharmaceuticals, in consumer products, utilities, petrochemicals, even things like finance and management consultancy, which don't directly uh, require uh, a degree such as chemical engineering or biotechnology. Uh, just to give you more of a feeling, I'll just give you a few famous names uh, who've uh, worked, who, who did degrees in chemical engineering or biotechnology. 
Uh, so the first one is uh, Johnny von Neumann. Uh, he was uh, one of the inventors of the digital computer. So he's kind of the American Alan Turing, if you like. Uh, and his first degree uh, was in chemical engineering. Uh, Margaret Hutchison Russo, uh, she invented the process which allowed the manufacture of penicillin to be scaled up. And she did that very rapidly um, just before the D-Day landings so that there was enough penicillin available to treat the casualties on the beaches uh, at the D-Day landings. And that's believed to have saved the lives of about 15% of those casualties. And of course, since then, millions and millions more people have been saved uh, by the industrial production of penicillin and related um, antibiotics. Uh, she was also the first uh, female member of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Um, so uh, this is his, his Excellency Professor George Maxwell Richards, who was the fourth president of Trinidad and Tobago, and he actually did his PhD uh, in this department, went on to work for Shell and then the University of West Indies before becoming uh, the president. This is Cindy Craw Crawford, well-known actress and model from the 1980s. Again, she did her first degree uh, in chemical engineering. Uh, this is Jim Maxwell, who you probably know of because he's just bought uh, a larger large part of Manchester United Football Club um, and I think by some measures is the richest person uh, in Britain. You might not have heard of this person. This is Karina Jo, um, obviously substantially younger than these other people. Uh, in January 2021, she was the only person in Oxford working in the lab on the scale up of vaccine manufacture and she became extremely important in developing the scale up of the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine for uh, COVID. Uh, so really key uh, in the response to COVID uh, in, 19, uh, in 2021. So again, what this shows you is actually what you can do from a chemical engineering or biotechnology degree is extremely varied from the president of Trinidad and Tobago uh, to saving people's lives with uh, vaccines. So now let me move to the second part of the course, uh, which is something more specific about this department and about how you would apply uh, to Cambridge. So uh, I'm sure you understand that Cambridge is a, a world renowned place, and that is also true of this department and the course in this department. When people produce uh, league tables in national newspapers and so on, uh, Chemical engineering and biotechnology in Cambridge often is the top, and if it's not the top, it'll be one of the top two or three um, courses in the country or even uh, internationally. We've got excellent facilities, of course, for both teaching uh, and research uh, in the department. So what does this, the course in Cambridge look like? Uh, it's a four year course um, and the first year is called Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology, CEBT, Part 1A. Now that combines studying the underpinning science with starting to develop your engineering skills. So half of the course is actually taught uh, in uh, the natural sciences tripos, studying mathematics uh, and chemistry. And the other half of the course uh, is in the department here, uh, starting to develop uh, more applied skills. So that's the first year. The second year, not surprisingly, is called CEBT 1B. Uh, and in that year, you start to look more at the core applications of the science. How would you apply the science you learnt in the first year, or indeed at school, uh, to real world important problems and challenges in chemical engineering uh, and biotechnology? Uh, and that will include some laboratory work uh, on um, chemical engineering and biotechnology. The third year is called CEBT Part 2. Um, and again, you continue to develop uh, core applications for applied uh, problems. Particularly important in that year is that about half the year uh, is um, doing a design project. Uh, so I said that uh, design was very important for chemical engineers and biotechnologists and this is the most significant part uh, in the course in which design is taught. So groups of about five or six students tackle a major design problem uh, over a period of uh, probably three, four, five months uh, during that year. It is possible to leave after three years, in which case you would get a Bachelor of Arts degree. This being Cambridge, we have funny names for everything. So instead of getting a Bachelor of Engineering degree, you get a Bachelor of Arts degree. 
Most people, probably 90% of people, choose to stay on to the fourth year and many of them take the opportunity to do some vacation work in applied, in uh, appropriate industries between the third and the fourth year. That's not a requirement of the course, but obviously it's useful for people when they're starting to think about what career they wish to do. And then the fourth year, which as I've said most people do, is Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology Part 3. And this is the stage of the course where there's quite a lot of optional material. So you get much more cho choice about what you study uh, in this year. Uh, so for example, you can choose to specialise a bit more in biotechnology or a bit more in mathematical modelling or a bit more in applied uh, chemical engineering. Um, and again, importantly, about half the year is, uh, in this case, a research project. So you will also get the opportunity to start to study um, research related material. And that's usually done in pairs over the entire year, occupying approximately half your time. If you choose to stay on for the fourth year, you'll graduate with both a Bachelor's of Arts degree and a Master of Engineering uh, at the end of that fourth year. Both the three-year and the four-year courses are accredited with the Institute of Chemical Engineers, which means that you've got the first step from this degree uh, to becoming a chartered uh, engineer via the Institute of Chemical Engineers. In order to actually become chartered, you have to do some applied work in industry and fulfil a few more of the requirements. But all the academic requirements uh, would be completed as a result of doing a degree uh, in Cambridge. So the course is um, set really fundamentally by what are conventional lectures. You listen to someone like me sitting in a room, as you can see these people sitting, and I'm sure many of you have done many of these things in the past. This is what sets the syllabus of the course, essentially. So one lecturer talking to 40 to 80 students, and typically you'd have eight to 10 uh, such lectures per week, probably slightly reducing uh, in the fourth year and the third year, where you've got, uh, first of all, the design project and then the research project to do as well. Um, also, there's quite a lot of uh, lab classes. So this is practical experience gained via these lab classes. We also give you a bit of workshop experience. So you learn to manufacture uh, objects as well as do experiments in, in the laboratory. And that would typically be one afternoon per fortnight in the first and second years. Third and fourth years, as I've said, focused on the design project and the research project instead. And you'll write reports which are assessed to cre towards the credit uh, of your degree. And so you learn to write reports as well as learning to do uh, the practical work. Now, one uh, feature of the Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology course, which distinguishes it from certainly other courses in Cambridge, is that we have quite a lot of project work. Now, I've already talked about uh, the research project and the design project in years four and three, um, but there's actually quite a lot of other project work, somewhat smaller in scale. So we do quite a lot of extended exercises, often done individually, but also sometimes done in a group uh, of two, three, four, five. Um, and this gives you the opportunity to solve problems which you wouldn't be able to tackle in an exam. Uh, so, for example, you might be able to solve problems using computer software, one very important computer software uh, in uh, chemical in the processing industries is called Aspen. Obviously, you can't use that in an exam, but you can use that uh, in the extended project work we're talking about here. And also, you can do much more extensive problems. So typically, these problems might take you two or three weeks to complete uh, over um, uh, to, to complete the pro pro to complete the project. Um, and obviously that's very different to solving a problem in half an hour in an exam or something. So these become more realistic projects and ones which you can tackle with more realistic um, facilities uh, such as uh, computation. Again, this is part of the assessment which leads to the degree. Um, the overall practical and pro project work continual assessment makes up about one third of each year's marks. The other two thirds coming from uh, the exams, which are generally held at the end of the year. And then finally, uh, unusual in Cambridge is the existence of colleges. Um, in terms of teaching, the colleges provide small group super supervision. So these are groups of two to three students, often from the same college, but not always from the same college. Uh, and they will discuss problems related to the lectures 
uh, with a supervisor who may be a graduate student, a postdoc or a lecturer, but someone expert in the subject uh, they're talking about. Uh, there's around 30 colleges in Cambridge, uh, all except one of them uh, does uh, chemical engineering and biotechnology. So uh, you can apply to almost all of the colleges of Cambridge if you wish to study uh, this um, subject. Uh, the colleges also provide uh, pastoral support, library facilities, sports facilities, accommodation, and what you'll find is that much of your social life focuses on the college uh, rather than the university or, or the department. Uh, so that gives a flavour of the course. Uh, what about if you wish to apply, which obviously we hope you will. Uh, so the application process goes like this. First of all, you need to choose your course. Um, there are a number of chemical engineering courses in the country, obviously, so what you want to do is make sure you understand what makes Cambridge different or similar to other courses. Um, key differences might be whether it's a three-year course or a four-year course, whether you get an MA at the end, and obviously we're relatively unusual in being a chemical engineering and biotechnology course rather than simply uh, one or the other. We don't have industrial placements, some courses do, so again that's a difference. So first thing will be to look around uh, the country at other uh, chemical engineering or biotechnology uh, courses and decide whether this is the right one for you. Once you've done that and you've decided to apply to chemical engineering and biotechnology in Cambridge, you need to choose a college. Um, it doesn't really matter which college you choose in terms of what studying here will look like, so long you don't choose the college which doesn't uh, to take, doesn't take students for chemical engineering uh, and biotechnology. Um, your academic experience will be pretty much the same regardless of which college uh, you go to. There will be differences in student life experience um, depending on the emphasis of each college. So it's just a question of preference, which seems attractive to you. If you're unsure, you can make what's called an open application in which case you'll automatically be assigned to the college with the least applicants in the subject to which you're applying. Um, the next thing you need to do is check the admissions uh, requirements, whether you need to do a test, what the registration deadlines are and so on, and those are slightly different for different colleges, so you do need to decide which college you're applying to uh, before uh, doing that. Uh, and finally, you need to make the application, which means full of filling in uh, the UCAS uh, application form. Um, you then need to uh, do what's called the My Cambridge application. This needs to be completed by the 22nd of October, and that's giving some supplementary information uh, to the university in addition to what's on the uh, UCAS application form. Depending on your college and your subject, you may need to submit some written work uh, or you may need to take an admissions test. Uh, in chemical engineering and biotechnology, the normal thing for most colleges is that you need to take an admissions test, uh, usually uh, sometime around the end of October or the beginning of November. Um, having done that, uh, the uh, test obviously will be assessed and depending on the outcome of that, you either will be invited to interview uh, or you won't be invited to interview. Generally speaking, around two thirds to a half of people who take the test are invited to interview in December. Uh, the interviews uh, generally happen over the first uh, three weeks of December and you will receive a decision uh, in um, January as to whether you've got in or not. So the interview obviously is something very unusual in terms of university application. Uh, there aren't very many um, universities that have an interview process like uh, Oxford and Cambridge. As I've said, it, it, start, it happens at the start of December. The interviews are conducted by the colleges. So the, the, the organisation which determines whether you're admitted to the university or not is the college to which you've applied. Uh, the interviews may be online or they may be in person, depending on the college. So if you have a strong preference for one or the other, that would be one of the things you should think about when deciding which college to apply to. Um, each college obviously has an admissions website uh, and you should look at that before making your application to a college. Applicants will normally have two interviews, not always, sometimes it's one, but most applicants in most colleges get two interviews and the interviews tend to last uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and they're normally conducted by uh, tutors 
and they're generally academic and subject focused. So you'll be asked questions on mathematics, on chemistry, on biology. Uh, it's not going to be about um, what your last holiday was or which uh, sorts of music you uh, most enjoy. It's fundamentally an academic uh, interview. Uh, so what are we looking for in those interviews? We're looking to explore your ability to tackle problems. And key to that is that often they're somewhat unfamiliar problems. So you may find yourself trying to solve a problem which you haven't previously done at school. So it's not a question of testing your knowledge from school. It's a question of testing your ability uh, to solve uh, and think about problems. And that means that you can do very well in an interview without actually getting to the right answer ultimately for these problems. Um, things we're trying to assess, for example, are independent thinking. So can you think about a problem without being told how to solve it? Uh, can you critically analyse information? Um, and can you present your thoughts uh, fluently, both on paper uh, and uh, in speech? Entry requirements for the course. Uh, generally speaking, if you're made an offer, uh, it would be A star, A star, A, um, with all three of those subjects being in science uh, or maths in general. Uh, to come into this course, it's a requirement usually that you do maths and chemistry. Um, physics or further maths or biology are all great, but they're not essential. Obviously, you can't do all of them, and so they're not essential uh, at A level. So maths, chemistry, and one of physics, further maths, and biology would be the most normal uh, set of um, uh, subjects to get a, an offer based on. Of course, you may not be doing A-levels, and the most common thing that people are not doing if they're not doing A-levels uh, is IB. And generally speaking, an offer in the IB would be a score of 42 with 776 in the higher level subjects. And the higher level subjects should mirror those that I've just spoken about uh, for the A-levels. There are obviously many other qualifications and the university website gives much more information on uh, how uh, other qualifications are handled, for example, from uh, different countries. In addition, um, you'll need to sit the uh, pre-interview assist assessment test, uh, as I've uh, already mentioned, as part of your uh, application process. Now, after the interview and after the application process and the tests and so on, there are actually three possible outcomes. The first is that the college you applied for, or the college to which you were assigned, if you made an open application, may make you an offer. Uh, and as I've said, that's likely to be A star, A star, A. Uh, colleges can modify that. They can make it a bit lower or a bit harder, uh, depending on your particular circumstances. And they can also vary, for example, the subjects the offers are made in. Uh, but that's a typical offer. Um, Many applicants, of course, achieve significantly more than that. For example, you may be doing more than three A-levels or you may get A-stars in all of them, but that's usually the minimum requirement uh, to get your place. So that's the first outcome. The college says, yes, you've got a place. If you get your A-star, A-star, A, you're in and you can come to Cambridge uh, in the following October. Second thing which is possible is that the college thought you were a very strong candidate but didn't have space for you in that particular college. And in that case, you get put into what's called the winter pool. And that allows other colleges who perhaps didn't have so many applicants in the subject you applied for uh, to look at your application. Uh, and so you may find that you get made an offer by a college you didn't apply to, or it's possible that you get asked uh, to come to a second interview uh, in that college later in, um, in, in January or early February. So that obviously uh, gives other colleges the opportunity to look at a wider range of candidates and it also makes sure that if there just happen to be a large number of applicants in a particular subject in one college, it smooths out uh, the chances of everyone getting in uh, and makes the whole system fair, more fairer. And of course the third thing that can happen is the college replies to say that actually you don't have a place and then of course there's lots of other fantastic universities in the country and indeed beyond the country uh, where you will thrive. So it is not the end of the world if you don't get in here. So thank you for listening to this um, talk. Um, I hope you'll consider applying to Cambridge and in particular applying to the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology.